And today I'm going to give you five tips on fall inspections and it all starts now. Let's get right into it. What's up? I'm David Burns and fall is a difficult time to inspect bees. At the making of this video, we're eight days away from fall and the reason why fall is tougher is because the bees are more heavily populated. The bees have much more honey to protect. You know, back in spring, your hive was kind of small, just starting out. But now they're protecting honey and there are 40 to 60,000 bees. Plus, there's a dearth. Bees are all home, not many are going out. Some are going out on goldenrod, but nothing like springtime. And all that together makes for a much more defensive colony, much more difficult to work in the fall. So you need to be better prepared to make these fall inspections. And today I'm going to give you five tips on fall inspections and it all starts now. Let's get right into it. Tip number one is you need to have a plan. You can't just open up your hive and start checking out things willy nilly wondering, you know, what am I looking for? I really don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe check for the queen. Got to have a plan ahead of time. And so the bees are much more defensive. There's a lot of robber bees out, scout bees, and the minute you open up your hive, those scout bees will detect that there's honey, that they smell that honey in your supers or in the brood nest area. They're gonna go back to their hive and say, we've got a hive opened up, and it doesn't take 10 or 15 minutes before these scout bees are bringing in other foragers to rob out your hive. So I want you to work uh, with a plan in mind, and I want you to work decisive, quickly, get in there, get out of there. When I open up a hive, there's three things that I'm looking for. The first thing I'm gonna look for are resources, because usually I'm having to take off a honey super or two, and I'm deciding, should I leave a super on for winter, or maybe they don't have any honey at all in those supers, and so it tells me that the hive may be starving for, for more food. Second thing I'm looking for is brood. I want bees of winter physiology that I've mentioned in my past videos, that if I don't see frames of capped over pupae, I'm in trouble. I need to have anywhere from four to eight frames, both sides capped over of pupae, capped over cells, so that I know I've got bees of winter physiology emerging in a month. The third thing that I'm looking for are problems. I'm going to be looking to see, do I have some problems with diseases? I'll look at the brood. I'll see if there's any perforation in the center, sunken brood. Does it smell bad like American fowl brood? Those are the signs for uh, American fowl brood. I'll look at the larvae to, de to decide if my larvae is pearly white like it should be, or is it starting to turn gray or become invisible where I can see the spiracles? And is it standing up in the cells? If it is, then that's European fowl brood. I'm also looking for parasitic mite syndrome. Pretty common in the fall after the mites have taken their tolls throughout the year. You might see spotty brood pattern, population declining, uh, some of the larvae looking poorly, and that could be what's called PMS, parasitic mite syndrome. Next thing I'm looking for, and again, looking very quickly, I'm looking for pests such as mites. What is my mite count? Can I do a mite test very quickly, see what my mite levels are right now? It'd be a good time to do it. Um, also, I'm looking for a small hay beetle. Are there a lot of small hay beetle? Do I have a beetle infestation? Do I need to put traps in there? And then lastly, if you can see behind me, it is almost fall. The corn is ready to be harvested. And as soon as they start harvesting fields, mice lose their home and they run into hives. So you've got to get your mouse guards on your hives before mice start looking for a warm place such as a beehive to spend the winter. I'll leave a link below uh, so if you want to make sure you have these uh, mice guards on your hive ahead of time, it's much better. I think you should have them on there before your first frost. So tip number one, have a plan. Tip number two, approach the hive with everything you need. I made a list of all the things that I like to take out to the bee yard with me, especially in the fall. When you have to work quickly, you can't open up your hive and then leave it open and walk back to your house and get something that you forgot. You gotta take everything so you can work quickly. So I made a list of things like that are obvious and some things you may not have thought of. Listen to this. You need to take your smoker. You need to take smoker fuel. You need to take beetle blasters in case you do see a lot of beetles. You need to take oil to put in those beetle blasters. 
you need to take a queen pushing cage in case you're wanting to break the queen's brood cycle. Take some reading glasses in case you uh, have it difficult to see in the eggs or a magnifying glass or certainly take your cell phone to take pictures, take it back, take a look to see if you can see eggs. You need to have things like a hammer in case you need to hammer a nail back in, a screwdriver in case you need to pry or screw, uh, screw a screw that's worked out. You need to take some duct tape. Sometimes my hives have little cracks in them. The only way I can fix it at this time of the year is just duct tape it a little bit. Some Gorilla tape will hold it well. If you're gonna do a mite test, take all the mite test items that you need. A jar, the screen, the powdered sugar, or your alcohol, your alcohol wash containers. Take all of that with you on this inspection. Hive tool, lighter to light your smoker, gloves, hat and a veil. Uh, you need any kind of protective gear, take that out there. If you're taking protective gear and you're only wearing maybe my cowboy hat and veil, I would encourage you to also take a bee suit. In case the bees get riled up, it'd be easy just to step back and suit up a little more than having to walk all the way back to the house and get your bee suit. And it's hot and dry in the fall, so take some water or what I recommend is this drip drop that I love using. It keeps you hydrated. I've got links to most of the things that I'm mentioning in the descriptions below. Now, one of the neat things that I have started doing recently is I've been using a special cart to put all of the stuff that I just mentioned in this cart. It, it is beautiful. It's called a Zuka, Z-U-C-A, a Zuka cart. I've tried all different kinds of things over the years. I've tried five gallon buckets that have a special insert for tools. And I can put all my stuff in that. I've tried uh, people that manufacture tool boxes for beekeeping. I've tried those and I'll leave links to those in case those work better for you. But what really works good for me is a Zuka cart. If you've never seen or heard of Zuka carts, they're used in a lot of activities and I love it for all my beekeeping supplies. Take a look at this. It's beautiful, it has a, a bag, it has a, it, I sit on it while I'm working my hives. It has all the little openings and compartments where I can put all of these things that I just mentioned on this cart. And it glides so easily through terrain of all kinds and everything is right there that I need. I don't have to worry about going back, going far away to get something. And that's important when you're making these fall inspections. I'll leave links below to my Zuka cart and my bags and things that I put in it. It just makes it so handy. I assure you, once you pull one of these, they glide without hardly any effort at all. And it's just nice to have everything right there. You can sit on it for a chair and it has places for your water bottle, your rags, everything I mentioned. It is so fun. So you'll really enjoy a Zuka cart in beekeeping. So tip number two, take everything with you that you're gonna need. Tip number three is, let's talk about the inspection. You inspecting the hive has to be purposeful. It has to be quick. I don't want you to go so fast that you become kind of careless or you drop things or clumsy. I'm not talking about that fast, but fast enough that you are working and you're getting it done. You're making eye contact with what you know that you need to see, uh, meeting the goals that you already have established. Remember tip number one, I said, let's know what you're looking for, such as you're gonna look at resources, you're gonna look at brood, you're gonna look for diseases, and you're gonna look for pests. You're gonna just kind of glance through that very quickly. Don't spend a lot of time. How much time should you spend on this inspection? Well, I don't want you to spend any more than 15 minutes. We don't need to keep this fall hive open more than 15 minutes, or we will attract robber bees. So we have to get in there, get it done, and get out. Might be a good idea right now, a good time to say, before you do this inspection, why not put either a robber screen on the front, or if you want to go ahead and put your mouse guard on the front, that helps a little bit with robber bees as well. Take your top cover, turn it upside down, stack off your supers over there and cover those supers so that we can cut down on the amount of uh, honey that's going up into the air and other robber bees, scout bees are detecting there's free honey. We wanna kind of cover that up. Be careful, it might be a hot day. You don't wanna suffocate the bees that are in there. So you might lift it so it's off of your top cover when it's upside down so that it can get air under it and maybe not close it off entirely on the top if it's a real hot day and you wind up having it covered for a long period of time. 
15 minutes isn't gonna really change much. Over 15 minutes, that's too long to keep your bees in your super uh, without air. So start looking for honey supers, start looking for how much honey is in the brood nest area. Uh, if you live where I live in the Midwest, north of me, kind of north of Tennessee, you're gonna to wanna to go through winter with about 40 to 60 pounds of honey in that hive. So you'll have to kind of do the math to decide how much you wanna leave on there. Start looking for brood. Do you really have enough capped brood? That's essential right now is capped over brood. Those are bees of winter physiology. That's what I'm really saying that we have, need to have plenty of, anywhere from four to eight frames of capped over brood because when they emerge, they're gonna live anywhere from four to eight months. This is a good time to figure all that out using my inspection guide. It's a PDF download electronic file that you can print off and take with you in a booklet or something. But so many of you have enjoyed that and bought that. So I'll leave a link for that. Helps you keep track of what you're looking at when you're doing this inspection. This is the time to solve problems. This last late summer, early fall inspection, this is the time to say, uh-oh, I'm queenless. Uh-oh, I have a mite problem. Uh-oh, I have a beetle infestation. Uh-oh, they don't have enough food on board. I need to feed them. This is why I'm telling you, you gotta get in there and make a full inspection. Tip number four is one of the most essential. A lot of people don't think about it. This is a gold mine opportunity right here for you. Listen to this. I learned this the hard way. Have an emergency plan. Now, what does that mean? Well, plenty of times in the fall, well, I'm working bees that are more defensive, they're all home, they're protecting all that honey on there. Guess what? All at once they had enough of me and they don't like me in their hive anymore. You're, you may find this to be true in your case. There comes a point, I mean, you're gonna have so many bees that are upset with you that you have to abort the inspection. And when you finally abort the inspection, you, only, you have to leave time in order to put it all back together. So I start, I keep watching my bees and once I realize that, oh my gosh, I can tell it's gonna get worse rather than better, I wrap it up. Even if I'm not done, I'll come back another day. I've got hundreds of bees pounding my screen maybe, that's time to wrap it up. So in order to have an emergency plan, I put all my frames, I keep working it so I know exactly where my frames are gonna go. I don't have to think about it. The frames that I've removed, I put them back in, I've got my supers lined up or my deep whatever. I put them right back on, right back on, and I put my top cover on. I've got good smoker, good smoker fuel handy. You have to have that emergency plan because I'm telling you, in the fall, bees are all home and much more defensive. And when you get the whole thing torn open, you've got to really sometimes put it back together fast having that emergency plan. So take it apart in such a way that you can put it back together quickly. I've got the final tip number five coming up, but if you've enjoyed this video so far, give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. I appreciate you watching my videos so much. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for watching. Now let's get into tip number five. Tip number five is to wrap it up. So there comes a point when you've seen enough. You know what kind of resources you have. You know what kind of brood you have. You know you don't see any diseases. You've kind of used my inspection guide to write everything down, to think it through after you put the hive back together and then come up with a plan for your next time in to uh, implement things that need to be corrected or improved or feeders that need to put on. So now we just need to put it back together. Here's the kicker. You know what the most important bee is in this colony? Yeah, it's a queen, right? She's been walking around on these frames. If you kill her now, you may not find another replacement. Who knows, it's late in the year. So of all things, you've gotta go in and provide 100% protection, making sure your queen is not on a place on the frame where when you put your frames back together, you might smash her. So I want you to really give high priority to make sure you don't hurt your queen during this very thorough 15 minute fall inspection. Do not kill your queen. Put it all back together. If you need to manipulate some frames, like maybe you only have two frames of honey in your honey super, maybe it's time to take that off and harvest those two frames. Just take it off the hive. You don't need it, it's not enough. Don't leave a half full super on your hive as you go into winter. Bees may go up there thinking it's full and you only got a couple of frames and they may starve out. So. Uh, Take off any boxes or supers that aren't gonna be filled up now 
uh, due to the lateness of the season. Finally, let's do an inspection of the outside of the hive once you get it all back together. I want you to look carefully and see if you've got any fingerprints of honey because your gloves sometimes get a little sticky on the outside or propolis or something. Uh, maybe you could take some water, maybe add a, uh, just a touch of vinegar to your water and go out there with a rag and wipe down, not the front so much, but the sides. I, I don't want to drip any vinegar or water onto the bees themselves, but on the sides or the back of the hive, let's clean off any smell of honey, fingerprints of honey, because that may attract robber bees if your boxes on the outside have your honey fingerprints on them. Now I'm going to jump right into coffee time. It's been a while since I've had coffee time with you. I'm going to talk about how to keep your life in proper balance. It seems like that's a tough thing to do. Uh, sometimes we go all in on one thing. Uh, other times we are kind of running a life where we're not dedicated to the things that are most valuable in life. We, we're not balanced and it makes us very mentally unhealthy. So I'm gonna share with you during coffee time on keeping a balanced life. Let's get right into coffee time. It's good to be with you for another coffee time. It's always a lot of fun. I started coffee time back in 2020 during the pandemic because I wanted to be able to spend some time talking with beekeepers just about life because I felt like a lot of beekeepers and people in general were kind of uh, pinned up in their homes, not a lot of social activity. And so I've kind of cut back on the amount of coffee time, but a lot of you have told me how much you like it. It seems like you want to get to know me a little bit better. So that's why coffee time's all about. Um, I'm just speaking from my heart about philosophy, a little bit about how I view life. And today I want to talk about a balanced life. We hear a lot about living a balanced life. You know, a lot of people talk about um, living a balanced life makes you more well-rounded, makes you a healthier person. Well, what does it mean to live a balanced life? When I look into it, and if you look on the internet, you Google it, everybody says to live a balanced life, you need to exercise, you need to eat a proper diet, and you need to get significant sleep, you need to get along with all your friends and relatives and have good social entertainment, and you know, it just goes on and on. You need to have a job that you enjoy. Um, and so it sounds like what most people are saying is you need to live sort of like a perfect life. And I thought about that for a minute because it'd be easy for me to say, you know, to live a balanced life, you need to work hard and play hard. You've heard stuff like that, little catchphrases. But let's take this idea that you need to eat better, exercise more, and sleep better. And then you'll have a balanced life. Really? I mean, come on. First of all, uh, there is already enough stress in your life, am I right? And if somebody comes along and says, you need to sleep better, you need to eat better, and you need to exercise, that adds more stress. Because just to exercise more means that you're gonna spend a half hour to an hour a day, uh, and you really don't have that much time now to do the things that need to be done. How am I gonna work another hour of exercise in my life? How am I gonna get more sleep? How am I gonna be able to eat a nutritional meal every single meal when I'm on the road or when I'm working outdoors, you know? And it just makes more of a kind of a give up attitude. Like I, I'm not gonna be able to live a balanced life. And then most people say you need to make sure you get along with everybody, have good relationships with your significant others, your family, your friends. Uh, you know, who has a life like that? I mean, we, really can't pick our family. We can't always get along perfectly with our family members. And so it becomes kind of challenging when we try to make a balanced life out of what we're dealing with already that's causing things to be off balance. So I thought I'd share some of the things that are important to me, some of the things that I am not perfect at, but some things that I am working on to help me balance life. And you know, as a content creator here on YouTube, it takes, I spend a lot of time creating videos. One video takes me at least one to two days, eight hours a day to publish and to get, get up on YouTube. Filming it, you know, getting ideas in your head about what to say, putting these uh, scenes together, taking the shots, opening up a hive, you know, getting cameras set up. I spend a lot of time and that time uh, steals away from living a balanced life so sometimes I think that we 
know what we need to do, but we're so busy living a life that it's hard to work it all out. And that's where a lot of the uh, imbalance comes. So what I've tried to do over the years, and I'm not perfect at it, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to tell you uh, <laughs> everything that I do that is working out perfectly for me. But what I've had to do over the years, and I've learned this kind of the hard way is, that everything that goes on within my uh, life, it really all originates from within here, within here. Meaning that no matter what happens on the outside, it's how I interpret it and what I do with it that determines how it affects me. Um, in other words, we really can't change our schedule. I mean, maybe, but you know, it's not, we're gonna be able to change our schedule overnight. We're not gonna be able to go to work tomorrow and say, hey, I only wanna work two hours a day for the same pay. I mean, you just can't change your schedule. You're living a life of raising children, working a job, you know, your schedule is what it is. Um, so we can't change that. Maybe you can't really add another hour of exercise into your life. Some people can't exercise because they have a bum knee, they have health problems uh, with joints, maybe arthritis. Uh, they just can't exercise. It's not gonna be in the picture. Um, a lot of people can't do other things like, like I mentioned, a healthy diet because you're on the road. So what we have to do is decide, maybe living a balanced life has more to do with me internally, how I interpret the world around me, how I react to the world around me. And so I begin to look at how I'm reacting to my life and to the world around me. And that's not easy to do because we are raised a certain way. We're kind of taught how we react to life. We, we're, we've picked up signals from other people we have been raised by or we respect, how other people around us are reacting to things. We typically react the same way. But we have to learn to uh, realize that everything starts from within us. And it's very hard to understand or to grasp or even for me to explain. But everything that I think of in my mind, I'm giving a lot of real estate in my head for my whole body to react to it. Like if I think about something as negative for a long time, then that's not good balance. I'm, I'm thinking about negative things, I will become a negative person. And so I need to find a way to say, how can I take control over what goes on inside of me? Even when things on the outside, even when things around me are not going the way I want them to, or maybe they're going in such a way that they can bring a lot of imbalance to my life, how can I react in such a way where I can remain balanced on the inside? I guess one of the easiest ways for me to explain this might be that in your life, you have something that is stressful. You may have a relationship or something at work that's very stressful. You may have an activity that's very competitive and it's causing you to um, be at peace with your progress and you wanna do better. I don't know, you, you have something in your life that is causing you a level of stress. That stress is being internalized by you, nobody else. Uh, Usually what's causing us a lot of stress is not causing anybody else any stress. It's just causing us stress because of our ego or because of what we want to accomplish that we may not be accomplishing. And so we're the ones that are stressed, nobody else. And that's my point. It has something to do with what's in us that's allowing something on the outside to get, on the, get in on the inside and cause us not to be balanced. So to be properly balanced, we have to build guards within, kind of like filters, I guess. Filters on our eyes, our ears, so that when we hear things or see things, we filter those and we don't let them injure us. We don't let them throw us off balance. What throws us off balance, I think, you know, is fear. If you're afraid of something, uh, that can throw us off balance. If we're worried about something, we're off balance. If we're angry, these, these negative emotions, these aren't always negative, but for the most part, uh, emotions that 
hit us in a negative way. Those are the things that are happening around us and we internalize them and have a negative reaction. So we have to start teaching ourselves and training ourselves that there's no reason for me to see this as negative. These things are just happening and I have to accept them and move on. I have to uh, say, okay, this is going on right now. I'm not gonna get angry or mad about it. I'm gonna remain patient. I'm gonna re just think of it as a learning activity or maybe I'm progressing. Even sometimes I say, normally this would have made me upset, angry or mad or disappointed, whatever. But this time I'm not, I'm gonna try and experiment. I know what, how this is gonna go down and I'm gonna do everything I can within my internal, you know, interior me of not letting that touch my soul, not letting it touch my energy. I mean, we waste so much energy being negative, being upset, being angry. I think we're only given so much energy a day that we're able to utilize. And we can use it all up either mentally or physically and not have any more energy. So I don't wanna waste my energy on things that really have little to no impact on my day overall. I'm trying to focus my energy on positive things, things that I can invest my given, my daily given energy into positive scenarios, positive outcomes. Even if I have to take something negative inwardly, I work on it before it comes in and I change it into a positive scenario and I'm happy to work on it. And so when I'm done, I'm not responding, I'm not reacting to a negative event in a negative way. I'm reacting to a negative event in a very positive way. Does that make sense to you? I can't really change things around me. I can't change people around me. I can't change my schedule that much, you know, but I can change me. And I can begin to see things and have a more balanced approach to life inwardly in my thoughts, in my heart, in my perspective so that what's happening, happening around me does not cave in on me and crush me. Rather, I use things around me to actually benefit the things and help me achieve the things that I want to achieve. Um, I guess one of the things that I can give an ex as an example is making this video right now. Um, it would have been easy for me to have been negative. I tried to film this video for three days, but it's just been too windy. And I wanted to film it here. And so I have, a, I have a weather map that shows me and predicts the weather. And so I'm like, oh, it predicts the wind too. Okay, it looks like it's gonna be nice on Wednesday. I'm gonna wake up, set up, start you know, filming early and enjoy filming outdoors. So I wanted to do this coffee time outdoors. I had to wait three days for the weather to cooperate. And even then, setting this scene up was very challenging. Um, it, it was difficult to get all the lighting just right, to get the sun off my face. Uh, you might notice that my camera's moving back and forth as I talk. I had to set up the camera so it can uh, be able to track my face and move back and forth. Uh, and so it just took a lot of time. And some of those things could have been frustrating. Like, why won't this work? What's wrong with this now? But I didn't. I, every time I make a video, I try to think of at least one thing that I can do and learn to be a better videographer. I try to figure out how can I better, be a better YouTube creator with every video that I make. And so I'm learning, I'm taking negative things that normally would kind of cave in on me and make me frustrated about either the setup or the filming or the lighting or uh, maybe making something too familiar. And I, I'm thinking about ways to improve my videos. So I think, okay, this is really good. This is just like video 101 for me. So I'm learning instead of getting frustrated. And so whatever it is you're doing, you need to take those moments that it can be frustrating and irritating and let that be an internal classroom education for you to say, how can I deal with this with a mind and a heart that makes it positive in the end instead of negative? 
All right, well, that's coffee time, and I hope you enjoyed that. By the way, before I go, let me encourage you uh, to subscribe to my videos. I appreciate that so much. We're still trying for 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And look at this great coffee uh, cup today. This coffee mug has a B on it. Isn't that awesome? Wow. It was gifted to me by a YouTuber that uh, uh, actually saw that I was having coffee time and sent a coffee mug in for me to use in a video. I've used it before. If you want to send a coffee mug to me, I'll leave the P.O. box in the description below and you can send me your mug of choice and I'll use it on an upcoming video. Now, if you're just joining my coffee time, I haven't had one for a while. Let me share with you a moment that I make my coffee myself by roasting my own green beans and then I grind my beans and then I use a French press to actually uh, press my coffee beans when I add the water to them, the coffee grinds, and uh, make a delicious cup of coffee. And my choice of coffee right now, I tried a lot of different brands, but right now my choice is uh, Yerga Chef from Ethiopia. I really love the taste of that coffee. Let me taste it. Mm. Now, some of you may be watching this all the way to this point. And if you are, you are a hero viewer. <laughs> One of the things that I've been thinking about doing is a uh, live chat where I can actually uh, invite a lot of my uh, viewers to come on live with me, ask questions. I just can't decide if I want to do that or not. Um, it seems like it's time to do it seems like it would help my channel a lot uh, for me to connect with my viewers more as you can ask me questions. I, I just really need to do that. So leave some comments below and let me know what you think about me starting a live chat where I could do live streaming. I guess it's the proper word for it. Uh, but do live stream and then you could chat with me online as we talk about different things. Um, a lot of YouTubers are doing that now. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on how that would work out for you, if that would be something you would do. Would you come on in a live stream? Would you enter in and, and do a little talking about bees and how to maybe question, I could answer questions. So let me know in the comments below what you think about uh, live stream, live chat. Well, I'm gonna go folks, good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Be sure and check out my website at honeybeesonline.com. Right now, we're in the midst of our Winter Be Kind production, getting those candy boards all ready to be shipped out sometime in December. If you haven't placed your order for the Winter Be Kind and you live in the north here in the U.S. where it gets kind of cold and you need some candy boards to feed your bees in the winter, be sure and check it out in the link below. I'll see you next time.